Let's start by throwing it open for any general questions you might have. Good. Now that we got that out the way. Stephen, I have something just very general about our portfolio. Um, my portfolio, my translations have changed drastically since the first, since John 1. Um, I have now started paragraphing. Um, so there's, there's quite a, I'll have to go right back to John 1. Um, is there a possibility that, I, I don't know if I'm going to get finished with all of this because it, it looks um, <laughs> like quite a lot of work to go right back and, and um, rethink my whole um, translation. Um, when is the last when we can have our portfolio in? Is it middle of February? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I did attach a date to the assignment, so whatever it is on the assignment activity is what it is. It's around about the beginning of February. Um, it sounds like you're talking about formatting. I'm not sure to what extent you'd want to go and restyle the translation. I don't think that's really necessary. Um, yeah, I'll mostly look for the translation being sensible and then I'll focus on the notes. So, uh, And I would look for correspondence between your translations and your notes. So if you say this is a such and such a genitive, did you translate it that way? So that's probably the level at which I will look over it. So I certainly wouldn't think it's worth trying to retranslate everything. No, it's basically restructuring, I would say, um, more than retranslating. But what I'm also, I don't know if the rest also have that, I have lots of notes. Um, so to choose which to keep and which to let go um, is, is fairly difficult for me. I have not done that yet. Um, so maybe someone can just tell me if they struggle with the same. I don't. Uh, like in Colossians, I have nearly 50 notes, <laughs> and I have to choose from those 50, 20 of the best. But, um, so yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. <coughs> the rest I was of told us haven't started our notes as well. And Estelle, you've just made Marilyn depressed. Now look what you've done. Uh, I was at a, we had a doctoral seminar with a guy from Scotland over the weekend. Last no, it wasn't a weekend, it was last week, Friday, Thursday and Friday. And one of the stories he told was having a student who wrote a thesis that was two hundred thousand words when it was supposed to be a maximum of a hundred thousand. So the university told him they were not prepared to accept more than a hundred thousand words. So, he, so he said to his, he said to Ian Shaw, who's the the chap who did the seminar, he wasn't his official study leader. He said to him, "What must I do? I've got a hundred days until I've got to hand this thing in." And Ian's response to him was, you, "You've got to sit at your desk every day for a hundred days, and every day you've got to trim a thousand words out of your document." <laughs> And that's what he did. For a thousand days, he sat and cut a thousand words out of his thesis and eventually passed. Yeah, I don't want to have to sift through 50 notes for each chapter, so the request for approximately 20, make them good, is, is more or less where it should be at. So you're going to have to sift through those and you know, pick 20 that are hopefully meaty. Okay, other questions? In terms of timing, obviously, we're going to take a break now after this, and we'll have one more live session dealing with the last passage in the new year. I can't remember the date, somewhere in the middle of January, I think. So we're nearly at the end as far as this journey is concerned, but we'll take a break over Christmas. I don't think we're going to do anything between the 16th of December and the first week of January, or at least there's nothing expected from the course, no discussions, no meetings, etc. 
Any other questions? Okay, let me turn off camera and turn on screen share. Just give me a sec. We're going to look at Matthew 13, which is the next passage on the hit list. It doesn't look right. Why don't I get an option to share this? There we go. Tell me when you can see the screen share. Remember that you can hide the pictures of the participants by clicking on the icon at the top left when you hover your mouse and they pop up. Can everybody see? No, it came up and disappeared. It came up and disappeared. Okay, let me try again. So, share. All right, should be up. I can still see it. There we go. Thank you. All right, I'm going to hide the participants, at least on my screen. I don't know if it hides it for everybody, but we should still have it there then. Okay, so it's Matthew 13, ostensibly the parable of the sower. And we will try to run through this fairly quickly and cover as much of it as we can this morning. Let's make one last attempt to get Henny. So, ente mera ekine, Marilyn, ente he mera, mera ekine. In that day. Excel thorn. Marilyn. Must I carry on? Uh -huh. After going up. O Jesus tes oikias. Jesus from the house. <laughs> Ekatheto. I couldn't translate that word. I got it as a third person, middle passive. Um, but that's as far as I could figure out. U problema. Ekatheto. It's imperfect. So it's from kathemai. If we take the root as kathe. I'll type at the bottom here. Kathe, so essentially we've added the augment and we've added um, the third person middle passive ending. So we have ekatheto, means he was, and the word means to sit. Should mean to sit, to be in a seated position. So, Oyesus. Oikias, Tes Oikias is going with Excel phone. So having gone out of the house, Ho Jesus, Ekatheto, he was sitting, Paraten Thalasan, Marilyn? Alongside the lake. Polikala. Uh, Dio? Kai Sunech Thesan, Pros Auton, Ochloi Poloi, Estelle? Kai Sunech Thesan? And great crowds gathered. Um, Kevin, I want to ask you something about um, translating our verbs literally. I see that many translations translate the imperfect um, as a normal aorist, as a normal past tense. But in our uh, literal translation, we um, I always bring out the imperfect sense, which which is in this case was sitting. If we look at it, I um, but then in my actual translation, my refined translation, is it okay then to use sat instead of was sitting? Yeah, frequently, frequently the context almost forces you for the sake of correct English usage to translate in a way that doesn't make the underlying Greek form transparent. So it's not always possible to translate 
literally. Um, for the purpose of this exercise, I wouldn't mind if you translate it was sitting or sat. Uh, <clears throat> the you know even even sat I guess likely conveys the durative idea because the very notion of sitting isn't instantaneous. It's not something that's over, generally speaking, in a moment. And the context that follows would make clear that he is sitting throughout the teaching that is delivered, which, by the way, is customary in Matthew's Gospel. As far as I know, almost every time we find Jesus teaching, we also have him sitting, the Sermon on the Mount being another obvious example. So if you translate, he was sitting beside the sea, that's absolutely fine. Um, but stylistically, if you prefer to translate, he sat by the sea, that's also fine. I think at this stage, it's helpful when it doesn't sound weird. It's probably helpful to try to bring out the tense when you can. So probably helpful to translate something like was sitting beside the sea. Okay, sorry, Sister Kevin. Something else that I was wondering about is aspect. Um, can we bring aspect in, like when it's present in, say, continue? I'm not a fan of that, to be honest, because I think it overstates what's present in the Greek text. So I, I don't like, it's a personal thing perhaps, but I don't like translations like keep on asking and you will receive, keep on knocking and the door will be opened, or um, anyone who continues to sin uh, is of the devil, you know, that kind of thing. Some some paraphrastic style translations do it. I'm personally not a great fan of it because I think it overstates the aspect. Um, Thank you. So, so I give you an opinion, not a law. Okay. Nobody helps. Thank you. Give <laughs> yeah, it another question for verse one. Um, just in in translating it and doing some research on it. Um, just in terms of the, the article, um, just came across a number of, of the texts, well, the, a number of the, the verses that we're translating now, where, you know, someone like Wallace um, says something to the effect of that often the article has a notion of possession that can be inferred on it based on the context. And that in this particular context, it could have been translated, Jesus went out of his house rather than the house. Oh. What what would you say about that? <clears throat> yeah, I think that that I mean that there's no question that the article does often have some kind of a possessive notion, and uh, your your primary use of an article in English and Greek would be to point to something in context. So unless there's a house that you can identify in the immediate context that he was in. Now, let's say you could identify that he was at the Pharisee's house a few verses beforehand. Then the house would be the house that we've been talking about in the preceding context. If that is not present, you would normally have ho Jesus exelthon tes oikias. He went out from a house. So I would think it does make sense in this case. If there's no context, and I haven't looked for it in chapter 12, but presumably there's no context that has him in a clearly identified house, um, then to say that he went out from the house probably does mean uh, it's a reference to his house, or at least the house where he was staying. It may not have been the house he owned. So, good point. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the, the article has this wide range of use in Greek that... Many of them are mimicked in English, but by no means all. All right, so, kai sunech san, air is passive. We can see our distinctive the and our augment. So, they gathered, pros auton ochlo polo, large crowds. Hoste auton is ployon embanta ka thesai. Leilani? This one? Hoste auton es ployon embanta ka thesai. 
and just the last part from hoste. From hoste, that clause. Okay. So that he embarked into the boat to sit. That's how I translated it. So that he embarked into the boat <coughs> to sit. Hoste is, a, is an interesting word. If we open BDAG, you'll find one of its uses quite common is that it'll give the result of something. So it's, it's introducing a frequently a result clause. Here it is. Followed by the accusative with infinitive. Now remember that sometimes an infinitive functions as if it is a finite verb and it'll have a kind of subject. But if an infinitive has a subject, it's more a logical subject than a grammatical subject, the subject of the infinitive will be in the accusative case. And that's happening here. Hoste gives us a so that, a result. So large crowds gathered around him with the result that he sat. Carthesthai, we're going to translate it as an air. Um, well, he was sitting, I suppose we could translate it. Uh, but essentially, Carthesthai following hoste is functioning as if it was a finite verb in the sentence and it's taking out on as its subject. So, hoste out on Carthesthai with the result that he was sitting. Is ployon in a boat, embanta, from embaino, we can see that it's a participle, there's our participle morpheme, it's an aorist participle, you can see our stems changed, we've lost the added components there, the root just being ba, so embanta, an aorist participle, it's accusative, and it's agreeing with Auton, so it's with the result that he, having embarked into a boat, was sitting. More natural English, probably, yeah, so that he got into a boat and sat down. But the way the grammar is constructed is a tad unusual. Does that make sense? Can I move on? I'll take silence as consent. So watch out for hoste, sometimes um, taking an infinitive as if it were a main verb with an accusative subject. No. Sorry, um, wouldn't it be better English to say so that he had to embark into the boat to sit? Uh, there's nothing there's nothing in the context that tells us it's a compulsion that he had to. I mean, we might infer that the crowds were pressing around him, but it, it might simply have been expedience rather than necessity. So I'm not wild about had to. Anyhow, okay, I'll leave so you to grab. That sentence doesn't make very good. It doesn't make for very good English grammar. <laughs> No, it doesn't. So this, this ho you're going to translate hoste with the infinitive as if it was a main clause generally, and I'm sure if we go and check a few, that's exactly what they're going to do. So that he got into a boat and sat down. <clears throat> um, that he got into a boat to sit. So you get the idea. The key idea is that hoste is a result and the infinitive is functioning as if it's the main verb, like he, it's equivalent to hina with a subjunctive, except that it's expressing a result of what's just happened. And the subject, auton, is actually functioning as the subject of the action in the infinitive. Those are the key grammatical components. You can grapple with how best to put that in English. Kai pas ho ochlos epiton agialon histeki. You have an epic on Gary. Kai pas ho ochlos epiton agialon 
this would be the shore, and this we haven't had before. Yeah, um, what I've got is, um, and the entire crowd or the whole crowd stood on the shore. No, it's the Northos. So this is, if we look at it at the bottom here, it's a pluperfect form. I'm not sure if it's pluperfect in meaning. I haven't had a good look at it. Uh, but it's a pluperfect form. There are very, very few of them in the New Testament. So few that the grammars, the introductory grammars, generally don't ask us to memorize what they look like. You can pick up the odd one as you go. Um, if it has its literal meaning, the pluperfect usually indicates an action that took place in the past time with results that continued for a period but have ceased at the time of speaking. Um, so I guess it's easy to understand while, why Matthew would have used a pluperfect here. He might have been indicating they were standing on the shore and they continued to stand on the shore for the duration of Jesus teaching, but obviously by the time Matthew writes, they are no longer standing on the shore. So it's like a perfect, except it's a step further back into the past than the perfect typically. It would indicate an action like a perfect where the effects of the act remained for a period of time, uh, but had ceased by the time the author writes. Very few of them in the New Testament, and we're not going to exert any energy trying to remember the form. Basically, it's the crowd stood or had stood on the shore. Kai elale sen autois pola en parabolais legon. We'll be back to you. Marilyn. I think so. Um, and he spoke to them in many parables, saying. Idu, ex elthen hospiron tu spirin. Estelle? Kevin, uh, this part is over here. Um, I have translated as the one sowing um, to, to bring out, um, but Peter English is a sower went out to sow. Uh, that's right. Typically, quite often the present participle when it's used in this way, you know, the uh, holegon, the speaker, yeah. holegontes, the speakers. Frequently we translate it when, it, when it defines what somebody does, especially something they do as a vocation, it would be quite common to translate it using uh, that kind of expression in English, like the sower, the farmer, you know, whereas in Greek it might literally be the one who sows, the one who farms, the one who speaks, etc. Either is fine. So <clears throat> the one who sows went out to sow. It's not wrong, obviously, because we have such a rich tradition. So you assume the major translations had some reason. It's not wrong to translate it the sower, conveying the idea that sowing is something he does repeatedly, regularly, as part of his vocation, presumably as a farmer. But it's fine to translate it as the one who sows. Idu ex elthen or spiron to spirin. Comment on this? Estelle? Everybody still there? No. Can everybody can anybody hear Estelle? I can't hear Estelle. No, I can't. All right. I'm yeah, I can't carry. hear. I'm just going to carry on. I mean, in a sense, if you read the sentence, the, the article two is irrelevant here, because the infinitive spirin or spirin, if you prefer, would convey the idea to sow. You do ex elthen or spiron spirin, the sower to sow. So. The article two, with the genitive singular article used with the infinitive, doesn't really change anything. It still remains an infinitive of purpose. So the sower went out to sow. 
Kai into spirin auton ha men epesin paratenodon. Leilani? Um, I translate it, and while sowing, um, some indeed fell. Um, until where do I have to translate? Up to Hodon. Okay. Sorry, I lost my place here. I'm just trying to get it. <laughs> Who problema? I'm oh, sorry. Um, and while sowing, some indeed fell beside the road. Polikala. The... <coughs> Just wanted to draw attention to ento with the infinitive, often translated as a contemporaneous action. So while sowing, which is how you've rendered it, uh, it's probably literally in the act of sowing, you know, and in the act of sowing, which does convey the same sense of while sowing. Uh, notice again our ton, which is accusative is functioning as if it were the subject of the infinitive. So it's literally while he was sowing. Auton accusative, functioning as the subject of the infinitive, the logical subject, it's not, I guess, technically the grammatical subject. Kaento spirin auton ha men epesen paraten hodon some fell beside the road. Kai Excel fonta tai tapetina kat efa genauta geri. Okay. Um. Sorry, just give me a second to find it. Was that from verse five, Kevin? Four. So the last part four. of his four. The last part of last part of his four. Um, and some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and ate them. <coughs> X L Thonta. is. Well, is it X L Thonta? I've got L Thonta. Uh, what's going on here? It might depend on what we are reading. All right, so we've got a few variations here as far as texts are concerned. Uh, Excel thon. So some, trans, some texts have elf in tapetina, so they've simplified the grammar to say they came. Tapetina, the birds, cut efagon auta. Hmm, this is weird. Oh, it's nominative. No, then it's not weird. All right. Why would it be nominative? Why would that be nominative? All right, question for another moment. So it is nominative, be that as it may, in which case it, it makes... Because it's the same... It's the same cases birds yes no I've got I've got that it should be nominative but I was looking at it and thinking it was accusative I th thought I thought the the ta would not be present uh, Luan Luan I mean if we go Luan Luan Elthon Elthon so I'm not not used to the nominative singular participle having a, a tau al alpha. That's normally characteristic of the accusative. Uh, good question. Plural birds. It's nominative plural. Okay. All right. I stand. I stand embarrassed. Kai Elfonta. 
Sorry? I say you make us feel better because we often embarrass ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, blonde moment. All right, no, neuter plural makes perfect sense. Neuter plural nominative makes perfect sense. So, and the birds having come, cut ephagenauta, ate them or devoured them. This um, <coughs> estheo means to eat. Cut estheo with the prepositioning compound is a stronger form of it, normally in the sense of to devour. It. Um, yeah, just just strengthening the, the root notion with the prepositioning compound. Very common, the participle, especially the aorist participle, with a main verb in the aorist tense. When you're narrating, it's often just cor correct to translate these as two main verbs in step. So the birds came and devoured them. This being what Wallace calls a participle of attendant circumstance. Um, you can see, you know, the birds having come devoured them also makes sense, but in English it tends to just be the way one would translate this, they came and devoured them. Allah? What's Allah? Sorry, Kieran, just, a, just a quick question there. Um, in terms of, of translating it devoured as opposed to ate, um, you know, and I know that another, another way to translate it will be consumed, but why would you, why would the the weight be on, you know, the, the eating or the the devouring as opposed to just ate them. I don't know if I'm making sense. Uh, just having a quick squiz at the range of suggested glosses in BDAG. Consumes is probably better. Uh, the, <coughs> you know, if you were looking at a lion devouring a carcass, Katef again probably has the connotation of a violent, ravenous consumption, hence the idea of devour. In our case, the notion is probably, you know, why did he use the stronger word? Well, probably to convey the idea that they consumed all of the seed. So it wasn't just they ate some of them. So, so the strength here is probably they, you know, they ate everything that fell on the, on the path, so nothing grew. Um, you don't picture birds really devouring, except maybe vultures, with a sort of ravenous, uh, aggressive, violent style of eating, which could be the connotation. That it's probably simply the idea that they ate up or consumed all the seed that fell on the road. No, great. Okay. Thanks. What's interesting is a lot of a lot of the translations seem to um, use the word devour, which I, I didn't kind of feel fitted based on what you've you know agreed with what you've just said. Yeah, looking at this list of glosses, I would probably go with consumed. Mm. All right, Allah, Allah de epesin, epita petrode. Rapu uk ichen gain polen. Who are we up to? Is it Estelle again? Even uh, before I answer, I have a question. There's a main verb between verses four and five. In my yeah. little translation, I wrote that out on the one hand, but on the other hand, is that right? Because I see many translations that do not um, translate the main verb. The yeah, the, the decision not to translate is motivated by English style rather than <coughs> um, Greek per se. So essentially he's starting a list. So we've got men, men episen paraten hodon, ala de, um, and we're probably going to have ala de again. So, so if we do this, let's see if I can get the four marked. We've got one. Amen. Ala de would be the second. So we're literally numbering groups using men at the start and then ala de all the way through. Ah, that's wrong. So there's our third one. 
um, and Allah Deh for the fourth group. So essentially the, the, the Men Deh construction traces all the way through the parable. It's basically like saying firstly, secondly, thirdly, fourthly in English. Um, translate it, don't translate it uh, is probably not critical. Uh, it's a nice marker of um, first some fell by the sea, second some fell by the etc, etc. The, on the one hand, on the other hand, on the other hand, on the other hand kind of translation for a fourfold repetition is going to make for quite clumsy English. It's going to feel awkward to have, on the one hand, some fell on the road. On the other hand, some fell in the rocky places. And on the other hand, um, some fell amongst the weeds. And on the other hand, some fell on good ground. You know, you, you've got four words in Greek that are translated by four whole phrases in English, so it, it tends to make for clumsy reading. That's why it's left untranslated in most modern the translations. The farmer has too many hands. Marilyn? The farmer has too many hands. You can only do yeah. it on one hand and on the other hand in English if you've got two hands. You are right. So English, on the one hand, on the other hand, does tend to be used to establish a, a contrast between two items um, and four doesn't really fit as well. This is a list of four cases. You know. uh, however you want to bring that out or not bring it out is up to you, but recognize in the Greek text the men dare construction traces through the four points. I would find a fourfold repetition of on the one hand followed by three on the other hands um, to be rather strange in English personally. You see, does, but I, I, I always, when I translate now, I always battle between saying true to the text and what makes sense in English and, and what would be acceptable um, when we translate. Because it's difficult for me just to leave something out or untranslated um, because then I think that, okay, well, you're not saying true to the text. But thanks for that explanation. This, this, would make, this would make a good inclusion amongst your 50 notes when it comes to this passage. You know, to mention the protracted Mende construction that provides a, a kind of numbering system for the points of the parable. But it's hard to translate literally into English. Okay, thank you. I have translated this. As, on the other hand, other seeds fell on stony ground. Polycala. So Allah clearly referring to um, the seed. Do we not have seed, seed is missing. No, seed, seed is, is missing. Seed is missing. Seed is indeed missing. So it's inferred from ha spiron to spirin. So he went out to sow. We infer, obviously, that it's seed. And ha, as well as Allah, which refers back to ah, uh, so some, other, 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 all presupposes that you've filled in seed. How interesting is that? Okay. Uh, it's Allah. Verse six as well, because it has the neuter article in verse or and in verse five. So it seems to be, yeah, a lot of missing seed. <laughs> it's actually up and it confused the daylights out of me to start off with. Well, I guess it does make sense that what was sown was seed, <laughs> but. Yeah, okay, interesting. So it's not explicit in the text. Allah de epicin epita petrode, but other seeds <laughs> fell on the stony ground, hopuuk ichin ten gain, where not it had, um, was having, was, you see, had is one of those verbs that you really can't translate what was having. It just doesn't make good English sense either. So we do typically translate both the imperfect and the aorist of echo as had much ground. Caiutheos ex anetilen diatome echin bathos case. Is it Gary? End of verse 5 or is it Marilyn? Whom I, I don't know who I'm supposed to be asking. 
Leilani, let's yeah. ask you. I, oh, okay. Ka you feel um, sex on etilin dia to me echin bathos case. And immediately it sprang up because it didn't have deep soil. Polikala <coughs> This is literally a genitive depth of ground but deep soil would be fine. Helude anatilantos e kaumatiste kai diatome echin rizan exeranthe. Okay, Gary, we're up to you. Okay. Um, I translated it, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Polikala. Heliu de ana tilantos. What is this construction called? Anybody? Heliu de ana tilantos. Is it a genitive absolute? Polikala, estin. Estin, a genitive absolute. Notice that this whole phrase is ungrammatical. So our participle is in the genitive, which is unusual to start with. Elu, son, appears to be functioning as the subject of the participle, even though son is also in the genitive. So even in your intuitive translation, when the sun came up, or when the sun arose, um, we instinctively are translating heliu as the subject of anatilantos, but in reality both heliu and anatilantos are genitives, and the participle is functioning as if it were a self-standing verb, separated from the rest, and it's giving context. Normally the genitive absolutes are temporal, so when something happened, which is exactly what it is here. Eliu de anatilantos, when the sun came up, but it's peripheral, separated grammatically from the rest of the sentence, and in fact you could delete when the sun came up, uh, and the rest of the verb, at least sentence, at least grammatically would make sense, but there's something contextual that's added. Okay, so well done. Genitive absolute <coughs> and uh, the grammatical parts don't function quite like you expect them to in normal grammar. Ekaumatiste, it was scorched kai diatome echin rizan and because of not having root exeranthe, it was withered. Same word that is used to describe the man who had the withered hand, if it's of any interest. Both of these are passive. Aorist passives. Sorry, uh, can I just I'll ask, what is the, the, the root of those two words? Because I was struggling to find them. I had an idea what they meant, but I couldn't find them. These two. The... Um, yeah, scorched and withered. All right, scorched. <coughs> typically, our ESO verbs end in delta, so that I would guess, just looking at it, odds are the root of kalmatizo is kalmatid, in all probability. <coughs> and then, typically, when we add <coughs> Eris passive tense formatives, this thing, uh, this delta goes to sigma. I think that is discussed in mounts. So, pretty sure it's kalmatid for that one. For x, eraino, the root, well, at least the eris, the present tense stem, appears to be serain. Now, probably, Probably, we can try and confirm this, but probably the root is ksera. If I do it by analogy, 
we are used to baino, where the root is ba, and it's modified by the addition of iota nu in the present tense stem. In fact, we had it earlier. Uh, if we go back to embanta, that's obviously n that's been changed for euphony. Um, so baino, but if we look at all the aorist forms, we'll find the stem has gone to ba. So my best guess here, I haven't looked it up, so you're getting me on the fly. My best guess is that our stem is xera. And let's see if that fits with what we have in BDAG. So <coughs> the future is xera no, xera na, no. All right, so clearly I'm wrong. Clearly the root, the, the root would be, come on like the root would be xeran with the new kept. The iota, as is frequently the case, has been added. But we can see the new remains in all the forms. It looks like the root is xeran, Marilyn. Yeah, the root is xeran. Uh, iota is added in the formation of the present tense stem, as it quite often is, especially with liquid verbs. You'll often find liquid verbs, and this is a liquid, adding iota to the form the present tense stem. Happy? So if we're recognizing xeran as the root of the word, then the form in particular is very easy because we've got an augment and an aorist passive tense formative, xeran te. Hepta, ala de epesen epitasacanthas. Kai anebe san, hai akanthai, kai epnik san, auta. I don't know who's next on my hit list. So, is it Gary? No, you did the last one. Might be back to Marilyn. These, these sentences, I had lots of words I couldn't find. Yeah, um, but it's all these words that keep changing between the. The uh, present form and all these second aorists. I'm not good with second aorists. Um, I got it that um, other seeds fell on the thorn plants, and then I hit a second aorist. From that Anabaino? That could be it. Yeah, now. I can't uh, find them in, 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 the, in BDAG or in my grammar, and it, and it just frustrates me, and then I, and then I move on. You see, it's, it's you people who insisted on working with book versions of BDAG. See how easy it is to find it on the computer version? Yeah, but, but not all of us have the finances to go out and buy nice fancy things. Yeah, I know. And I got my <coughs> book one from the library itself. <coughs> all right, so Ana Baino. Ana clearly is a preposition in compound. Baino, the root is definitely ba. And <coughs> iota nu is added to the root to form the present tense stem. So we can see all the way through here, ba, which sometimes lengthens to, to be, uh, is the root of the word. <coughs> so once I know the root is ba, this one looks pretty routine. So that falls off to make way for the augment, ane. And that's lengthening much like a contract verb would. Ane besan. Aorist active indicative three singular. Happy? It means yes. to, to grow, to go up or ascend, much like Jack's beanstalk. Kai ane besan, hai akanthai. So the weeds grew. Kai epniksan from. Nigo. So <coughs> to find it in BDAG, you'd have to drop your augment and look there, and you would probably start to find it. Um, do note that BDAG and most good lexicons will give you the other 10 stems. So it'll tell you, yeah, it's a first aorist like that. 
and the formation I presume is pretty straightforward. We've got an augment, nig, and we've added sa, and remember that when gamma has sa added, it goes to C. So any vila plus sigma goes to C. So that's a very, it's a completely regular first aorist form. Um, where are they? Nixan, so it's literally a plus plus san. Polykala? Polykala, Kevin. Okay, so this means to strangle. Was that Henny that's arrived? That is me. Sorry, I completely forgot this morning. <laughs> <laughs> No problem. I th I got it wrong last week and thought that we were meeting last week. Allah de epesen epiten gain ten kalen kai edidu karpon homen ekaton hode exera exe conta hode tria conta. Uh, who are we up to ya, Gary? Apologies if I lose track. Sorry if I no skip problem. somebody. Uh, and some seeds fell on the good soil and produced a crop. Some 100 fold, some 60, and some 30. Why did you translate Edidu Carpon as produced a crop? Um, let's see what I write about. Um, to see I think it had to do with um, uh, looking at, at, at something that Wallace had said about it in terms of the fact that um, it could be produced um, at different meanings depending on the context and so to give wouldn't really have worked out, but it was the giving of a crop to producing was the word to use. Okay, N not a problem. Eddie do tense is um, it is um, uh, imperfect. Polykala. All right, so the turn of phrase here is literally it was giving fruit. And the, the imperfect would seem to be significant because the idea is the good fruit continued, sorry, the, the soil that, the seed that fell on good soil with the notion of ongoing, continually produced fruit or produced a crop. Um, so it didn't necessarily produce a hundredfold in the first season, but presumably year on year it continues to produce fruit so the multiplication would seem to be over time not necessarily um, one massive harvest or, although presumably the harvest is also healthy. Okay so interesting I think it's a very significant choice of the imperfect tense to convey the idea of fruitfulness in an ongoing sense um, Good soil would be fruitful over a lifetime when we extend the metaphor. Time is running out. ota aqueto, the one who has ears, let him hear. Favorite or favored biblical expression, and then we're into this uh, rather strange comment on the role of parables, which we're not going to have time to unpack. I do just want to comment on one idiosyncrasy yeah, that might be strange. Dear um, tuto in parabolais autois lalo, therefore in parables to them I speak, hoti, and this is the phrase, blep pontes u blepusin kai akuantes u akusin. Um, is that it? 
getting myself, but while yeah, sometimes, sometimes suddenly it doesn't feel right. No, I've got myself bedwell. Okay, ignore me. It's not what I thought initially. Here it is. Here it is. Sorry. <coughs> um, so, akoi akusete kai usunete blepontes blepsete kai u. <clears throat> this duplicate of Blepontes is very weird. It's literally seeing you may see. And it's likely that it comes from a Hebrew expression that has been translated this way into Greek and borrowed here. Um, and the Hebrew expression would have made the first word emphatic, so it's that you may indeed see and not understand. So it doesn't really work to translate it and seeing you may see or you will see. Um, <clears throat> so the the double blep blepontes blepsete seems to be to convey the idea of seeing indeed. So the the duplicate is emphatic. So it's a, it's a Hebrew expression from a Hebrew word that or Hebrew grammatical form called an infinitive absolute, which is typically used to put bold and italics around the sister word. So, um, yeah, just be aware that there's this weird, weird turn of phrase here that doesn't make sense when you look at it in Greek. Okay, I think we're out of time for this morning. So, any final questions or comments? Okay. We'll try to wrap up the discussion around Matthew 13 before we break for the Christmas break. So the plan is to finish this text and then break yeah, round about from somewhere around the end of next week until, I can't remember, probably the 5th of January, somewhere there. Uh, and then we've got one passage to do in January and then finalizing your, your main assignment portfolio. So that's kind of the plan with nothing scheduled from about the 16th or 17th of December through to the 5th of January roundabout. Good. I think you've got Thanks to everyone. January. Pardon? I think you've got the discussion for, for this one opening on the 4th of January. Really? Yes, that's right. Oh, okay. That's a Monday, but, I think. I've taken notes of that. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's that's fine. I would have probably been eyeballing Christmas approaching and thinking that we didn't want to have this going on into that. So, are you happy with that? Shall we shall we carry this discussion over into the early New Year? Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. Fantastic. Great, everyone. Thanks for all your hard work. I think you're doing a great job on these, and um, it looks like. It looks like all the hard work is paying off. You're working with real Greek texts, not all of them that easy, and being able to make sense of them. So, commendations on your effort to this point, which I, I hope you, you can see is starting to bear the desired fruit. We won't then have any further interactions until the early New Year, so I want to wish you all a blessed Christmas. Trust it'll be a Christ-centered and Christ-filled celebration to those tasked with preaching over the Christmas period. Uh, pray for a, a fruitful Christmas for your churches as well. Uh, so have a good, a good break, a good holiday, a blessed Christmas, and we'll chat again in the new year as a group. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Kevin. Thanks. Kevin, can you please just send us the links to our live classes? We've um, the last uh, bunch of last classes concerning translations. I can't seem to find them. If you go onto YouTube and you search for me under Kevin Gary Smith, you'll find all my videos. They should be there. So my YouTube account is is in the name Kevin Gary Smith. Um, 
I did that and I find all sorts of other Kevin Gary Smith. Hold on. So I have it. It is. I'll try and paste it into a chat window. You might have to drop the S. So from HTTPS, I'm not sure. But essentially, that's my user account on YouTube. So you should find all the, the videos under that user account. 